It'll be five, be five years in September. Um, prior to that, I spent nearly 26 years with uh, Maricopa Community College District. Uh, was a, a vice president in the Strand Mountain Community College um, before I retired and came to work for APS. So, Stacy, you want to? Sure, happy to jump in. Um, so I am Stacy Micatrado, as you said. I am currently the director of operations support, which um, that really just means within the fossil generation organization, which is um, where we operate our power plants, that, that generation side of the house. Um, within that organization, I have responsibility for everything that falls under what we would call support. So anything basically outside of plant operations and outside of um, engineering. So those things are, it's kind of a mismatch of everything, but training um, that Clay just mentioned. Uh, the other thing would be our safety professionals who support the plants and then a variety of other folks who serve as sort of subject matter experts and support um, to our plant operations. So that's kind of my current role. Um, Clay gave me the opportunity to talk to you guys about um, just my path and how I kind of got to where I'm at. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and go through that with you. I um, never really thought it was all that remarkable, um, but I will say that, you know, kind of looking back after being with APS for 21 years, um, I can say that I would have never imagined um, being where I'm at today or kind of the path that I have taken. So kind of share a little bit about that, and then I'll turn it over to Neil in our environmental space to talk to you about that. Um, so to start with, like I said, I've been with the company um, 21 years, and uh, I started, obviously, when I was like 12 years old. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I started with the company in, um, when I was 20, 21. And at the time, I really had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. I mean, even looking back to like high school, middle school, you know, I just didn't really have anything that I was, you know, super passionate about. And, you know, in high school, when everyone's getting ready for college and everyone's, you know, there's some folks who are just, they know what they want to do. I want to be a doctor. They go to school. They're going to be a doctor and that's it. So I was kind of all over the board and not really sure what I wanted to do. Um, APS, for those of you who are not really familiar with the company, has a history of really being sort of a family legacy um, type of organization. A lot of employees have, you know, parents, brothers, kids that work for the company and it's just been a really sort of a family environment. So I kind of followed suit. My dad um, is an electrical engineer for the company, and that's sort of how I got my interest in starting at APS. So, you know, I started just an entry-level customer service position, and it was really just intended to be something that I did um, while I went to school, while I was going to ASU. Um, still just kind of not really sure what I wanted to do, just going through kind of normal business classes, that type of thing. Um, but within the, the company, APS, there's were so many opportunities and sort of one thing led to another and there would be another position that I would be interested in and I would, you know, move on. And I've had a series of uh, positions within the company. Um, so early on in my career, I was in customer service and um, just kind of started getting progressively more responsibility through the positions um, from more of like associate level to sort of analyst type roles. And eventually I was tapped on the shoulder and asked if I um, was interested in a leadership position. Uh, so once in leadership, um, I kind of was in my, I guess my area of where I was comfortable. I was in customer service and I had been there for years um, and I took a leadership position there. But once I was there, uh, one thing that this company has done a, I think a phenomenal job at is identifying folks that they want to just kind of throw into an entirely different organization. And so I kind of made some leaps across different organizations within the company um, from a customer service to transmission and distribution, which is really the, you know, line crews out in the field who build, you know, set the poles in the ground, run the wires, all of that. And I really had no exposure to, to that at the time. Um, and so as opportunities came up, you know, I kind of thought these were crazy and I don't know why they would want me to do that, but I kind of just jumped on them. And again, one thing sort of led to another. And um, so I've had a series of advancing leadership opportunities in the company. Um, and this latest one, I've been here for about three years working um, with the plants. 
And I can honestly say, I never thought I would end up here. This is one of the last positions I would have ever expected to have with the company, um, but I truly love it. And so, I mean, I think when I look back, I held probably at least six or seven frontline level positions. And then I think about five leadership positions um, with a short stint, even working directly for our chief operating officer um, in the middle. And so, you know, like I said, it was just kind of, it was an evolution and I never really planned and I didn't really ever have a path, but I couldn't be happier with, you know, the way it's ended up. And so when I think about speaking to you guys today in the educational space, and I think like what would be something, you know, that's relevant to you guys or to take back. And I think a couple of things that stand out to me was um, continuing to seek knowledge and experience, whether that's formal or informal. I and mean, there's really no downside, right, to learning more, whether that, you know, regardless of the subject, um, even if subjects that you're learning about are nothing to do with your current position, you never really know when they're going to come into play. And I think continuous learning in general shows, you know, folks, you know, that you're around that you are, you know, motivated and ambitious and driven and you're always looking for more. So if nothing else, I mean, I think people just continuing to look for knowledge and look for experience, that's, you know, a great thing. Um, the other thing that really stood out to me is, I think, you know, encouraging folks, young folks in jobs and school, whatever that be, um, to not be afraid to step outside their comfort zone. I think too often, you know, we're afraid to do something because like, oh, I know nothing about that. How, how could I ever do that? And I think some of the best jobs that I ever had and the most um, that I ever learned were positions where um, it was totally outside my comfort zone and it was very uncomfortable and it was challenging, but that's where I think I learned the most. And then I think, um, you know, if you say no to opportunities, if folks are giving you opportunities and you're not comfortable and you're not willing to step outside your comfort zone and because you're afraid of failing, really the only thing holding you back is yourself. And so, I mean, if I were thinking about, you know, young kids today and kind of morphing them and getting them ready for the real world, I think that that's an important um, concept there. And then finally, I would say, you know, trust people who see things in you that you don't see in yourself. Like I said, I would have never even imagined being qualified for certain positions or thinking that that was even something I could do um, until somebody said, hey, you know, I think this would be good for you. I think you could do this. You know, these are the qualities that I think that would make you a good match for this position. So again, if, you know, thinking about the, the younger group in high school or middle age or middle school aged kids, you know, they really need to learn to, tr to trust what other people see in them. Because I think sometimes we're our own worst critics. And so if we start to listen to folks, you know, who are in um, positions of authority and who have a lot of experience, I think that, you know, that's a really helpful sort of perspective together. So that's really all I had for you. Um, I am happy to, I think I have just a couple minutes. I think I had 15 minutes, but if anybody has any questions or anything for me, happy to take them. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it um, to Neil Brown, who's going to talk about our environmental, and I hope you guys have a, a great experience and that you guys really get some good takeaways from today. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, I am new to Zoom, so I'm going to try to share a screen here. That work? Are you seeing the... Yep. All right. Okay, um, so my name is Neil Brown. I'm the Environmental Operations Manager at EPS. Um, I've been with the company for about 15 years and I am a career environmental person, um, meaning my uh, undergraduate degree is in environmental science. Um, I started working in the environmental uh, space uh, immediately out of college. Uh, worked for about 10 years, actually had APS as, as one of my customers for a period of time, and then uh, ended up um, working for APS, and, and I can't agree more with Stacy's comments, uh, very much, uh, it's a big company that feels like a small company. Um, so today I'll uh, get into uh, what we do in environmental, um, and then talk a little bit about our, our clean energy um, future, which recently... Um, We've uh, made some changes in what the next uh, 20, 30 years look like uh, for the company. Uh, so real quick, this is our, our vision and mission and essentially what the environmental department does for APS. Um, we are tasked with uh, really 
two, two focus areas. One is environmental compliance, and we'll, we'll get into that more, but there are a multitude of environmental laws and regulations out there that the company must comply with. Uh, so we've got a team of about 30 people that that really is their, their main mission is let's make sure that the company operations day to day are um, complying with all those regulations. Uh, the second piece uh, for us is environmental risk. Um, are we engaging in any activities? Are our operations um, creating situations where we may be uh, creating environmental risk? And that risk can look like uh, you know, financial risk, a risk to the environment. Um, there's a variety of different types of risk out there that we look at, but really um, the risks associated with environmental events, um, which would you know, include air, water, waste type issues. Uh, so within the company, um, our customers, we really are considered a, a support organization. Uh, the bulk of our work, um, our biggest customer is the fossil generation fleet. Uh, that's our coal plants and gas and oil plants. They are highly regulated operations. Um, we'll talk about that in a few more minutes, um, but we've got teams out there that, that day in, day out, they are at our power plants. Um, making sure that we are uh, meeting all of our obligations uh, in, in keeping the environment clean. Um, we also support transmission and uh, the, the transmission and distribution uh, organization, which is essentially the APS uh, infrastructure and facilities that are outside the fence line at the power plant. So it's, it's kind of the balance of the operation. Um, we also work with some of our support uh, groups, engineering, planning, water resources, IT, um, you know, one interesting one here is planning and you might think, well, you know, what does planning do? And they're looking at long-term, you know, what, what power plants do we need? What kind of generation uh, resources do we need? You know, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, environmental actually plays a, a big role in much of that in that um, environmental constraints, uh, permitting requirements, those types of things uh, can play a large role in where you can build a power plant or, um, how you can expand the system. So we really do kind of touch a lot of different parts of the business, uh, which is something that I, I find um, fascinating. It certainly keeps life interesting. Uh, so, you know, where are we? Um, the gray area there is the APS service territory. Uh, we've got folks day in, day out that are um, all over the state from Yuma to Douglas, all the way up to Farmington, New Mexico, uh, Flagstaff, um, supporting our various operations. Um, the, the key code here on the map, those orange dots, those are our gas and oil plants. Uh, the three blue dots, and this, this map's not quite up to date. Uh, the three blue dots there are coal plants. Uh, Navajo Generating Station up in Page actually closed down last year. Uh, they are no longer operating, uh, but we do have folks at Choya and Four Corners. Um, and then you'll see Palo Verde Nuclear Plant on there, the, the maroon dot, um, they actually, Palo Verde has their own dedicated environmental staff out there at that plant. Uh, nuclear is a, um, a unique operation. All right, so to the meat of it, what we do, um, and, and the list of acronyms there is, there's a little bit of humor in that. I'm not gonna go through all of those. And generally we say, you know, let's not put acronyms in a presentation, but I just wanted to give you all a feel for um, the, the scope of uh, regulatory obligations that the, the company is subject to. So each one of those acronyms is a statute um, or law, essentially. The A at the end of each one stands for ACT. Um, and so all of those are environmental regulations um, that govern various parts of our operations. And I'll just point out a couple. Um, the second one down, RCRA, RCRA, that is a regulation that governs how we handle waste, whether it's hazardous waste or solid waste. Um, anything that we throw out is, is subject to regulation. Uh, CWA is the Clean Water Act. Uh, anything having to do with surface water, so to the extent that our facilities may discharge certain process waters, uh, they're subject to Clean Water Act permitting, and there's a whole permitting regime that, that goes with that and obviously limits on uh, the pollutants that we can have in that water may subject us to treatment type things. Um, there's, there's quite a lot that goes on in the Clean Water Act space. CAA, that is the Clean Air Act. That's a, that's a big one, um, especially in the fossil generation space. 
uh, these plants that, that burn coal or burn natural gas, um, all their emissions, and if you think of a car, think of the tailpipe, same idea, uh, their emissions are highly regulated. Um, we have systems in place where we know uh, on a minute to minute basis, the concentration of various pollutants coming out of those stacks. Uh, we monitor that very closely. We have permits that tell us um, how much of each pollutant we can emit. Uh, and, and we have, uh, quite honestly, we have folks that really only work in the clear and air act space uh, because of the complexity of it um, and, and the importance of ensuring that we are always meeting um, our, our permit limits. Uh, a couple others there of note, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, SCWA. We operate our own drinking water systems at a number of our facilities. Um, so we're subject to regulation there. Uh, down towards the bottom, many of those, MBTA, BGPA, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, uh, we have regulations that we um, must comply with in the natural resource space. So making sure that the birds are protected, uh, eagles are protected, endangered species, even cultural resources. Um, so what we do in environmental, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the, the compliance piece, um, which is, you know, focused on our day-to-day -day operations, and that's, uh, you know, monitoring what's going on at the plants or what's going on um, in our T&D operations, which might include construction sites or operations and maintenance type activities. Um, we are subject to audits on a, on a regular basis. We have folks come in from um, inside the company and at times outside the company uh, that look at our records, look at our permits, look at our operations, make sure that we are in fact meeting our obligations to protect the environment. Uh, we operate systems to, to help us in that space to keep track of all these obligations that we have. Uh, you, know, you can imagine we've got extensive record keeping and reporting requirements. Uh, and then we do a lot of work in the permitting space, which is either renewing existing permits that we have at our plants, or to the extent that we have a new operation or a new facility, uh, going out and working with the regulatory agencies to obtain new permits so we can construct and operate those facilities. Uh, we do quite a bit of testing, uh, meaning sampling, whether that's uh, you know, pulling water samples, as you see here in the bottom picture, um, or in that top picture there, that's somebody up on a stack actually uh, sampling the emissions from that plant, pulling air samples and understanding what what are in there, or what, what pollutants might be in there. Uh, we do quite a bit of training, making sure that our, our, our folks in the company understand what their environmental obligations are and making sure they have the right tools uh, to comply with those. Uh, we, we get into incident response, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but we do certainly have times, uh, as you can imagine, where um, we have emergent work, whether it's a spill or a release of some kind, um, and, and our folks go out and, and help respond to those and make sure we're getting things cleaned up and protecting the environment. Um, we work closely um, with our regulators. We are regulated by EPA. We're regulated by ADEQ, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, we are regulated at the county level, uh, predominantly Maricopa County, but also in Pinal County. Um, and then also at the, at the um, city level. Uh, we have obligations with, uh, for instance, City of Phoenix that we must meet. So, to the extent that those agencies want to develop new rules, we work closely with them to ensure that we strike a balance between protecting the environment, but also allowing our operations to continue um, such that we can uh, deliver our critical services. Uh, we do get involved in project management, and then I, um, I did touch on the risk piece already. So, so quite a lot in the environmental space. Um, some examples, uh, so the, the picture on the left is our, uh, Sundance Power Plant down near Casa Grande, uh, and that's one of our staff members out in a, a pond, and that pond is a permitted uh, facility uh, subject to regulation by Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, um, and he's out there um, taking a sample from that pond. Uh, on the right is a, a fairly, unfortunately, typical scene for us, for our folks that support our uh, transmission and distribution operations, and that's a pole um, and I'm likely in that one, that pole probably got hit by a car. And um, on those poles are transformers. Those are full of oil. Uh, when this happens, we generally have oil spills. Um, and we've got, you know, obviously regulatory obligations around that. We want to make sure that our oil from our equipment doesn't get into a storm drain or any other type of sensitive area. Um, and then we've got folks that, that get out there and respond and, and get those uh, cleaned up and make sure that we don't leave any 
residual effects. Um, this is also a good example of the training we do. So quite often, you know, typically our first folks on site are our troublemen uh, or our linemen. And um, they, they are trained to understand that, hey, we, we've got to get, you see there the floor dries down, we've got to get this oil spill stopped to make sure it doesn't impact um, a more sensitive area than just the street and the gutter. A uh, couple more examples. Uh, th this top picture is our, um, actually, this is an old picture now. This is our uh, Ocotillo power plant over in Tempe. Uh, so for those of you that um, are familiar with just kind of east of Tempe Town Lake, uh, you may recognize that, although in the last six months, those, those big structures have come down. Uh, the environmental role in all of that is, uh, you know, decommissioning, demolition, those, that type of work. Uh, comes along with, with quite a bit of environmental um, obligations and, and just some examples, um, asbestos abatement, removing hazardous materials from those units, uh, ensuring the dust is controlled as they come down, uh, oil and greases, those types of things. So heavy environmental involvement in those types of operations. Um, bottom left is another example. It's, uh, those are old, an old fuel tank you see there that's being decommissioned. Uh, environmental plays a big role in making sure not only that the tanks are, are cleaned out and ready to go uh, when we take them out, but also ensuring that we don't have contamination and there wasn't leaking. Uh, we get involved in taking soil samples and ensuring that we haven't impacted the environment for a tank. In that case, it's been there for many, many years, probably 30 or 40 years. And then on the right, is a glimpse into our future. Um, what you see there are a couple of uh, utility scale batteries. Um, they, they kind of look like big Connex boxes or semi-trailers, uh, but there's um, a whole bunch of batteries inside of there. Um, and while that is a, a big piece of the clean energy future, um, even the new technologies come along with environmental obligations and requirements. Um, one thing that as we look at batteries and we look at solar panels, and other new technologies and, and, and clean technologies is we look at those from a life cycle perspective um, and, and understand uh, what's required from an environmental perspective during their operation, but more importantly on the back end, when it comes time to decommission these things, um, when they're at the end of their useful life, what does that look like? Are we able to recycle these? Are they a hazardous waste, which we quite often see, unfortunately? Um, what are our options so we can minimize our impact to the environment? Um, when we move on. Uh, and then it's, I think this is my last picture here. Um, this is our Four Corners power plant. And I, I, the one thing I just find fascinating about this picture, this is a coal fired plant up near Farmington, New Mexico. Um, in this picture, you actually, you, you can't see the business end of this power plant. Uh, the units themselves that generate electricity and burn the coal aren't visible. Um, and if you can see my cursor here, they're behind these large structures. What you actually see here, all these, these large structures are pollution control devices. Um, this is all environmental going on here. These, these first buildings, these stacks here are no, are no longer in service. These were from back in the 70s. Um, these first large buildings are to control NOx emissions from that plant. Those were recently added. Um, the, the second set of buildings you see out, out here massive structures, it's called a bag house, that controls particulate matter. Uh, and just picture big rooms full of vacuum bags is essentially what those are. Uh, so we're pulling all the soot and ash out of the exhaust from those units. And then finally, over here, these big towers are uh, what we call scrubbers, and those are removing sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, and then finally, once you've had all that NOx removed, you've had the PM removed, the SO2, then that flue gas is able to go out the stack and what you see really there is water vapor. In the absence of water vapor, you, you almost can't see the emissions coming out of the stack. Um, if you contrast that with back in the 70s, uh, if you saw a picture of this plant, none of these devices were in place um, and essentially the, the emissions were uncontrolled at that time. So uh, we've come a long ways um, since then and these devices and this level of environmental control is really a lot of the work that the environmental staff does at these plants. So where are we going? Um, the clean energy commitment, this was uh, recently announced earlier this year. Um, and it's a long-term vision for the company um, to get to a point uh, in 2050 where we are generating 100% carbon-free electricity. Um, 
and one thing I'll point out here is that is you see different commitments from it in the business community, whether it's a utility or otherwise, um, there is a distinction to be made and, and quite often you'll see a net zero emissions um, standard, which is a little different than what we're doing here. What we're saying here is carbon free electricity. We will not be emitting carbon from our generation sources. Um, we currently do, obviously. The coal plants, the gas and oil plants emit plenty of carbon. Um, a net zero would mean that um, you could emit carbon, but you would buy offsets, meaning uh, offsets could be anything from, from planting forests to finding other ways to uh, offset your contributions to, um, of carbon to the atmosphere. So this is, uh, it, by 2050, 100% clean, very um, aggressive, uh, challenging goal for the company. Um, it, it is uh, 30 years out um, for a reason. Um, in that we will need uh, technology to be developed in that time to meet this goal. Um, we do have some milestones here. You see right now, 20, 2019, we are at 50% clean. And another distinction to make here, um, the use of the term clean versus um, renewable energy. Uh, a big part of our clean portfolio is the Palo Verde uh, nuclear plant. Um, Palo Verde does not um, emit carbon. Uh, so it is a clean source, um, and it's a big piece of that 50%. Uh, but going forward, it'll be um, plenty of reliance on Palo Verde and then building out new resources, uh, such as batteries and wind turbines, uh, which is a challenge for the environmental team because those are um, they're just new technologies that our folks will be trained on and have to really get um, more familiar with to understand the environmental um, nuances of those technologies. Clay, am I doing okay on time? Yeah, you got like one minute left. All right. Well, I'm on the last slide, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little more on the on the, the future and clean energy. Um, as I said, this is that 2050 goal is an aspirational goal. And, and really what that means is new technologies will have to be developed um, for us to get there. And, and we, we feel confident that that, that will happen. Um, it, will, it will certainly require the involvement of lots of stakeholders, um, and you'll see the list over there on the left, and a, a number of elements that will need to come together to get us there. Um, I think of this in terms of the market, um, and you know, right now, for instance, there are companies out there like GE and Siemens that are turbine manufacturers. They will have to innovate, and we will have to work together to innovate to come up with solutions to get us to a point where we can generate 100% clean energy. Um, the other two important pieces of this, so you've got the, we want clean energy, we also, as we go down this road, have to ensure that the power is reliable and that it's affordable. Um, we wanna make sure that when you flick the switch, the lights come on, that, that we, we, we cannot compromise in that space. Uh, and we also wanna keep uh, the power affordable. Um, so a lot of work to be done. Uh, absolutely, we will, we will get there, um, but it will, take, uh, it will certainly take the participation of, of many folks um, to, to get us there. Um, so one last thought is, I, is as I'm thinking about, you know, teachers and, and students and environmental, um, I, I would, from my perspective, when I was in school, science was absolutely my passion and the environment was my passion. Um, I never saw myself working for a utility in, in this space. Quite honest, I, I didn't really even know that this type of a career existed. Um, when I was coming out of school, the environmental movement was still somewhat, somewhat young. Um, most of the folks in our department have some type of science background, whether it's biology, we've got several uh, chemical engineers on staff, we've got uh, geologists, we've, we've got all sorts of science backgrounds. Um, and those people every day are working in that science space and applying what they know in the sciences to our business. And, and furthermore, the majority of those folks do have a passion for the environment and for protecting the environment. And that generally is what kind of draws them into this work. Um, so I guess my, my message would be, um, you know, for, for kids out there that love science, you know, there, there's, there's no limit to what they can do. And this is a, a career path that I have found to be absolutely fascinating. It's allowed me to pursue my passion for the environment. Um, also my passion for, for science and thinking in science terms. Um, but also to be in a, a very dynamic um, and exciting work environment. So any questions?
Okay. All right. Thanks, Neil. Thank and now, um, Sal Lopez. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, so my name is Sal Lopez. I am currently the fossil uh, CFAM, and that stands for Corporate uh, Functional Area Manager. I do work for the fossil organization, uh, and my boss is Stacy. So a little bit about um, my job. It's a, it's a support job that we do in, in our group, and we go and support, and, and my job is uh, the work management space, and we support all the sites in Fossil, uh, from procedures to identifying any training. This is where I bring play in to, to help me out with training. Uh, I too have been with the company for about 20 years, a lot of changes, and I completely echo what Stacy said earlier about getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, in Fossil, I've been in quite a few roles as well, from frontline to leadership, frontline leadership to manager jobs to now my current job. And we continue, you know, and I'm thankful for, for Stacy that keeps asking us to come out of our comfort zone. And this is where my topic today um, is going to be with Lean Six Sigma because it has been a little bit uncomfortable because I really wasn't aware of what this was, but um, it's pretty exciting stuff. I'll share my screen here. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Six Sigma today. Um, so what is Six Sigma? First of all, uh, at APS, we have partnered with ASU and we started uh, going through uh, green belt certification. We do have a couple black belts in our organization that facilitate and help us. But uh, starting this year, 20 of us were volunteered and asked to become green belts. And through ASU, uh, we got enrolled in their program. And it was quite a, uh, I would say it was uh, five months or right about five months, about 40 hours of classroom. And then the rest was going out there and identifying our projects. So, and making our projects. So what is Six Sigma? It's very simple. I mean, I could sum it all up in, in one quick sentence is the elimination of waste. Uh, and that would be great, right? We go out there and let's go eliminate waste. And I think, uh, you guys as teachers, as, as ourselves, you know, companies that have been around for quite a long time and, you know, teachers is, yeah, that's, you know, how do we eliminate waste if it's something that we've always done? You know, you've heard that. Why, why would we change it if this is the way we've always done it? We got new teachers coming in and they're told, no, this is the way it's done. Uh, and the beauty of it is, even for us, like I said, we started this back in late January, and I graduated from uh, ASU in June. So right in between there, I'm trying to do my project and everything, and then we get hit with the pandemic, and we're told, you got to do everything from home, right? So major game changer, but we had the support, and we were able to to push through and all 20 of us were able to get our projects done. So at, at APS, um, our, goal, our goal is actually to create a lean culture at APS. And how do we do that is we are starting with the 20 Greenbelt champions, which I went through. Right now, we started another course at ASU and this is all gonna be virtual for them. It's another 20 students that are gonna go through the certification and I believe they started yesterday. So that's gonna be challenging for them, but the beauty of it is since there's 20 green belts, we're there to support them and uh, make it a lot easier for them. So everybody obviously owns Lean at APS. And then I'll just go share the whole screen here. So this is uh, straight out of uh, ASU and, and Lean Six Sigma. 
it, it's a method that relies on collaborative team effort to improve performance by eliminating waste. And that is key, right? Because it's, a, it's truly a team effort when we go out there and identify the waste and try to eliminate it. Uh, Lean Six Sigma has a lot of great tools and has shown us how to identify that waste and how to go pick it out and get the best bang for your buck, right? So this is what we've been trained to do and it's a continuous improvement. And I know Stacy expects me that just because I graduated um, and now I have to, I completed my project, but throughout my career, um, the expectation is that I continue to identify that waste within the company and not necessarily just in fossil. I mean, we've been able as a team with the whole company work together and identify a lot of uh, waste and standardize what we do across the, the company as well. So this one here is, let's see. One second. Okay. So Lean Six Sigma in five minutes, this is, uh, was designed for us, but I want to focus on the very center of that circle is um, our model at APS is speak up, challenge, and empower. And like I said, it's, it's very easy to go say, oh, this is waste, let's go eliminate it without having the team effort or just simply speaking up and saying this is truly waste. Because a lot of times what we were taught, taught, taught was uh, a lot of the times when you're identifying waste, it might be your job that you're talking about. A lot of things that you do as an individual and you've always asked, why am I doing this if there's no value added and you start talking about it? And it's a huge fear, right? Because you're thinking, is my job gonna go away? And absolutely not. It's that you could be using your time for other things that are more productive and better for the company, just like you guys. But again, it's always been, this is the way we've done it. This is the way we're gonna do it. So you have to speak up. You have to challenge. Um, we've been able to, challenge our senior VPs and they're the ones that completely bought in. This is a, a program that started from the top to the bottom and they went through, through a lot of the training as well as my manager had to go through training to be able to support my, my efforts in, in Lean Six Sigma and we're all speaking the same language now. The thing with uh, Lean Six Sigma, you know, uh, we could get into the history of it, where it comes from uh, Japan, uh, Toyota put it out on, on Six Sigma, and there's a lot of terms when we talk in, in Lean Six Sigma, you know, Muda is one of them, that's uh, basically waste. Um, then you have words like Kaizen, it's a studies you do for uh, downtime and, and identifying the, the rest of the waste. But to keep it simple, um, ASU adopted this and kind of merged Lean and Six Sigma together. And there's been uh, decades and decades of studies on, on this. And with the great professors that we have, they kind of merged it in. And this is the, the program that we've adopted. So next slide is basically what they asked us, you know, this is what they needed uh, from us when we started our project. Um, this was a, took a lot of time, you know, because you really had to sit down and think about where am I going to eliminate waste? Uh, I, do I have the support from my leadership? Uh, just even coming up with the project. So on this one here, um, this is where they developed uh, to set the course, develop your people, know your projects. And then we had the team at APS along with our professors is to invite them to help us um, identifying our problem. About three minutes, so. Okay, so real quick, I'm gonna go through some of the tools that, that we use is obviously uh, this SIPOC uh, 
diagram template. It identifies your supplier, your input, your process that you're trying to change the output, and obviously our customers. So you start identifying those um, to start building your projects. And here's another diagram. And then we create a charter. Uh, and the charter starts with always a good problem statement. You're identifying the problem. Uh, a lot of the issues that we come across is we know there's a problem out there, but we always try to focus on the solution first. And we let go a lot of the input from our team members and other people that are, you know, have good input. And we just focus on the, on the solution and we're back to, to point A is trying to fix something that, that really wasn't there. So. Uh, I mentioned downtime study. These are the forms of waste and the acronym is actually downtime. It's defects, overproduction, waiting, not engaging employees, transportation, inventory, motion, and excess process. So when you pick a program that you're going to go do a study on, you pick all these and you try to pick at least, you know, all of them of what your defects are and, and move down and that kind of starts building your project. Then once you have that project identified, you start uh, your process mapping. And this could be anything uh, from uh, manufacturing, from your classroom on how you, you know, set up your day at a classroom, you start mapping it out and how it all looks like. And then at the end of the project, I've got all these uh, studies and everything and we had to present uh, an A3 project to the executive team and our leaders. So this is what took the about three months to compile because we had to go out there. And I wish I had a little more time and I can surely share this with all of you. Um, I'll, I'll give it to Clay, but this is my particular project where uh, as a CFAL, we go out and do site assessments at all the plants to identify any gaps that people have. And we're always perceived as police uh, officers out there trying to see what they're doing wrong and that's not the case so it went well and we've been since uh, implementing this at the sites so I threw this slide in you know eliminating waste this is actually in my garage my little shop area uh, how many of us you know have tools like my power tools there they're always lost I always had them in a in, in a chest or in, in a drawer and when I needed it, I couldn't find it. So this is part of leaning and creating a, a identifying your waste and standardizing. And now I can walk in through my garage, just take a glance at what my tools are. They're labeled, they're in the right spot. And if I know that one of my drills is missing because my son wanted to go mix some something with it or whatever, I know that it's missing and I can readily identify it. This is huge, you know, for your classrooms. I challenge this, you know, I, I know you guys use a lot of this, seeing a lot of classrooms, but this is using the, the lean concept. So anyways, it uh, looks like I'm running out of time and I thank you very much. And I now open it up for questions. We do have one more presentation. Um, and we will share these slides with all of you. We'll get them to Casey and then she can distribute. So we're going to try to hold a little bit of time at the end. I know we're running just a little bit long um, for questions. So um, with that, let me bring up Kyle Spalding. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Morning. Good morning. All right, can everybody see that? All right. Hey, I'm I'm uh, really grateful to be able to do this again. Uh, I got to do this last year. Uh, last year was 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 pretty nice. We actually got to be in the same room and and see each other face to face. But I guess I still see your guys' faces. So at least at least we got that. Um, so my name is Kyle Spaulding. I am the mechanical engineer for the uh, APS Ocotillo power plant in Tempe. 
Um, that's right next to the ASU stadium. I've been, uh, I've been at this plant for close to three years now. Uh, I've been uh, the mechanical engineer for the plant uh, about uh, two years. So in that time, I've been able to see uh, quite a lot actually. Um, I, I've been involved with uh, commissioning these five new LMS 100 units. Um, you can actually see them in the background of this picture. Uh, so commissioning a pretty much a brand new power plant on an already existing plant site with existing units running was uh, was was quite the spectacle. It was a it was a two to three year process. Um, lots of uh, issues to troubleshoot, and then all the while we're decommissioning the old uh, steam turbine boilers that uh, most everyone knows uh, with with the Christmas lights hung across them. Uh, in fact, I hear that's the biggest issue with uh, getting rid of those steam boilers was, was the community wanted the Christmas lights up still. But um, so I, I've had a, a lot of uh, great experience over the last couple of years, um, really grateful for it. I, uh, I just wanted to share with you guys what, uh, what the path of a, an engineer is like in APS. And I'll just share kind of some specific uh, stuff about myself and and how I got to where I'm at. If there's time, I'll, I'll share with you what I what I do today, just as a you know as a plant engineer. What do I what does my day to day look like? And then uh, and then I'll I'll hopefully give you some good takeaways for your classrooms. So uh, let me let me move my uh, slide here. Oh, seems to be stuck. One second, sorry. There we go. So um, this is the typical path of an APS engineer. Um, not not for all. There's some people who uh, who kind of jump in as a you know a, a higher level engineer. But usually for those of us who who come in as a beginning engineer, this is usually the typical path. Um, while I was going to school, I went to NAU uh, uh, studying mechanical engineering. And uh, while I was a junior going into my senior year, I, uh, I decided I wanted to do an internship with APS. And really, I had no plans to work with a utility. It kind of sounded like an old, an old crusty job. Um, utilities have been around for, you know, about 100 years. And I'm like, I doesn't sound very exciting to me. So I, I just wanted the resume builder. But uh, little did I know that I was going to absolutely love it. I had a mentor for three months. I went up to the, the Choya coal power plant by Winslow or by Holbrook. And uh, there I got to do a pretty big project with my mentor. Uh, we got to analyze and do a cost savings analysis on uh, how to change up uh, some parameters on how we run our steam turbines and, and how we run steam through our boilers. And just the, the analysis that we did, we were able to find uh, a, a way to run these units that could save us uh, almost a million dollars in coal every year. So it was, it was pretty spectacular for me to see that what I did made a difference. I just fell in love with being around the plant equipment. And uh, so from there, I was offered uh, a full-time position as a NEO. So what NEO means is new engineer and operations. Uh, APS has a, a great rotational program for us where we get a lot of operations experience. We do six month stents at each of the operations levels or positions just to really get to know how the plant operates. We get to go through the auxiliary operators jobs. We, we shadow them. Uh, they go around and actually are the, you know, the eyes, ears, and hands for the plant. They go open up valves, uh, check on, you know, critical equipment. So we get to learn a lot about the power plant and how it works. Then we get to go through a uh, rotational, uh, another six months with the control operators. The control room that actually controls the power plant is a room filled with, gosh, 20 to 30 screens as it's, pretty much a, a giant video game where the control operator gets to click on things, open up valves, you know, start up the units, 
Uh, it's a pretty expensive video game, but we get to we get to shadow them and see exactly how they operate the equipment. And then once we do that, we get to be uh, we get to shadow a shift supervisor, where we get to essentially lead that crew of of AOs and COs, and we get a lot of great leadership experience. We get to kind of see the administrative side of how to how to lead a crew in operating the power plant. Um, so I got to be at the Red Hawk power plant uh, right next to the Palo Verde nuclear station. So that was pretty cool for me. I made my way over to Ocotillo and that's when I got to see a lot of great things with uh, commissioning some new units and decommissioning the old. Uh, once you're done with the NEO program, you get to make a pretty big decision. You get to decide whether or not you want to stay a shift supervisor in operations and work your way through the leadership path or you get to go back to being an engineer and you, you have a, you know, a few options of what kind of engineer, engineer you'd want, want to be. Um, I was lucky enough to land a, a great spot as a plant engineer. Um, but there's all sorts of other positions. There's, there's a, you can be a subject matter expert. You can go into design engineering. You can, you can go into um, more project management. So there's lots of different, different paths for an engineer lots of great opportunities. In fact, some engineers kind of move back and forth between um, management uh, in, in operations, management in maintenance, all sorts of good stuff. So uh, let, let, me, let me go down here. I want to share with you guys what I do now and uh, what kinds of things are, are exciting for you to share with your, your classes as far as what, what kind of fun things an engineer gets to do. So these are the many roles of an engineer. I, I don't want to bore you guys, but I'll, I'll share with you guys at least a few things that I do that, are, that I think are pretty exciting. But then again, I'm a pretty big geek, so I'm not sure if they're exciting to other people. But um, So uh, one of the biggest things that an engineer, especially at a power plant, a plant engineer needs to do is we're kind of looked at as um, subject matter experts over certain things. Uh, luckily, we have lots of engineers throughout the company and each one is kind of a subject matter expert over a specific component or system and they're usually depended on in critical situations for troubleshooting. Uh, that the next line there, this is unfortunately the biggest part of our job even though it, it shouldn't be. Uh, we do a lot of support for operations in troubleshooting real-time failures and, and things that are you know critical we need this unit back now. Uh, really, our job should be more looking towards the future to prevent failures, but this is just the reality is we, we do a lot of troubleshooting and problem solving. Another thing that we do is we help maintenance to, uh, to uh, really develop a good preventive maintenance program. So that way we can uh, stay on top of keeping up the equipment so it doesn't fail. And then we do lots of other things like we, we, we actually do get to geek out once in a while and pull up trends do some failure analysis. That's, that's the real stuff that people think what, what they're going to do while they're studying you know, mechanical engineering in college. They think they're going to be doing all sorts of analysis and design work, but that's, that's pretty a low percentage of what I do. Really, I love the, the fact that I get to troubleshoot with ops. I kind of like being in the trenches with the guys. We're all trying to figure out what to do and how to make things more reliable. Uh, lastly, I, I just wanted to share that I get to actually do a lot of cool things with projects. If there's a big, a big million dollar project to replace some thing, some piece of equipment, a lot of times I get to be uh, almost like a project manager over that. I get to oversee and, and uh, ensure that it's done uh, correctly and I, I'm kind of the quality control person. So it's, it's really cool. I get to see a lot of cool projects. And I get to uh, kind of be in charge of a little bit of money. Not, re not really, but um, it, it, it's pretty fun to, to be able to manage projects with having the budget in mind, you know, kind of getting into the business sense as well, other than just being a technical expert. All right, how, how am I doing on time there, Clay? Am I okay? Yeah, you got like one more minute. Sorry. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. We need to get them out of here, not to get <laughs> okay. All right, let me, let me just step in with this. Um, some, I just wanted to share some things for you guys to take back to the classrooms, mostly things that I feel like helped me to get to where I'm at. 
Um, I got interested in energy while I was in college, but I would just, uh, I would just express that it's important to share with, with students. You know, they're usually worried about their next car or their next boyfriend or girlfriend, but really, uh, if you can try to express how important energy is to them and, and how they can make a big difference, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy just to turn on your light switch, but knowing what goes on uh, behind the scenes is, is pretty important. And, and I would actually, um, I would really love it if you guys brought your classes to one of the plants. And I, if you came to Ocotillo, I'd be glad to, to give them a tour and I'll try to get them excited about power plants and engineering. And hopefully they, they don't think that I'm too much of a geek, but um, I, I, uh, I have no problem uh, doing any tours if you guys want to come to the plants and, and help them get excited about it. Uh, the next thing is having good people skills and being able to communicate to your audience. Uh, also utilizing resources, knowing how to use the people around you um, and, and being self-motivated. I feel like these are really underrated qualities. Uh, a lot of times the, science, the, the sciences are, are just all about the technical, which is important, but um, some of the soft skills of communicating and and, and using resources sometimes get forgotten. Um, I, I pride myself on, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room, hardly ever, but I do know how to communicate with people and how to, how to find the right person to help me solve my problem. And, and I am a problem solver. So that's the thing about the sciences, the sciences is uh, you don't have to be a genius. You, you can just be good at problem solving and you'll do really well. Um, I also think that college is not an, the end game. A lot of people just simply want to get to college just because, because it sounds nice, but really college can be more of a tool. It, it's not a must, but I feel like it, it can be a tool to really help, you know, uh, launch yourself into a, a really good field. Um, that, that's, that's all I got. I, I, uh, I really enjoy uh, this opportunity talking to you guys. So if you have any questions, just please let me know. Yeah, and we'll, I know we're right up against the hour and you guys have to get to the next session. <clears throat> As I said, we will share, hopefully you can hear me. Um, we will share uh, all our contact information. We'll get that to Casey to get out to all of you. Um, I was trying to keep up in the chat. As things change and open up a little bit, we're more than happy to host you at one of our plants. Um, but as you can imagine, things are uh, a bit crazy right now. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I want to leave you with is that um, you saw about a half an inch, you know, we, we went about a half inch deep for APS, you know, and looking at, you know, a five mile wide thing. So wanted to give you a good idea of, of the types of jobs. Um, but by no means, this is all the jobs. So it's a, a great company, great opportunities. Um, you got the sense that science is important. Math is important. Um, communication is important. Um, so, and especially things like critical thinking. So as we're looking for employees, those are the kinds of qualities that we're, look, that, that we're trying to get. Um, with that, I'll stop. Um, thank you all for your time and attention. I know it's a bit challenging, um, but luckily we can turn our cameras off once in a while. But thank you. Um, enjoy your week and please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Clay and team. We appreciate you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.